news over the last couple of weeks. Our church, the cause of Christ, is under attack. It may not be locally, but it sure is globally. And anybody that names the name of Christ, anybody that understands that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, is part of the church, is part of the body of Christ. And whether it is overseas or in Wichita, Kansas, those that name the name of Jesus Christ that are persecuted, they're part of our family. And I was wondering about that just personally. As I was watching those 21 men on a beach being decapitated for the cause of Christ. That's part of our family. We may not know their names. We may not even agree with everything they do and everything they believe theologically. But we do know that they name the name of Christ. What would we look like? What would I look like? You know, I, I talk about our motivation and talk about our love for Christ. I talk about what Christ wants within our life. But if the persecution took place right here, oh, we say we love Christ, we'd say we live for Christ, we'd raise our hands to worship his name, but what if the rubber hit the road? And what if you were called to be a martyr? Do we stand up for the name of Christ? Would we stand up for the name of Christ? Would we bow our heads in shame? See, because I believe in the culture of our society, I believe we think, as long as I go to church, or as long as I pray, or as long as I worship, I'm doing Christ a favor. And I believe what we're going to talk about today is how to grow in maturity of our faith. So, so the church that we are growing up in, the church that we serve, the church that we love, is it taking us to a place where I became a strong follower of Jesus Christ? What do we look like a year from now? What do we look like five years from now? What do you look like? Is my faith so strong that I can stand up and I can proclaim the name of Christ? Or if persecution takes place, somebody ridicules you, laughs at you, or you go through a major calamity, do you fall on your face and worship his name? Or do you turn your back and say, you know what, I tried the church thing. I tried the Christ thing. It didn't work for me then, and I don't think it'll work for me now. And I'll turn away. Maybe, maybe in the future, maybe in the future I'll come back to it. But I believe the church is the most powerful entity on the planet Earth. I believe we have a volunteer base, a strength that nobody can match. If the body of Christ, the volunteerism within the church will say, I own this. My faith in Jesus Christ is so real. I understand the forgiveness. I understand what he's done for me. I understand the strength that I have within my soul. And what I have to do, I have to unleash it. And I don't believe the church and our society today can only unleash their faith and their power on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. I believe the whole part of our soul, the deepest convictions that we possess, has to be something that is laid out and played out every day of our life. I believe the church has to be that entity within the Christ, I'm sorry, within our life that Christ can be glorified in. In Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about something, and we're talking about the body, the church, not Glenville necessarily, but we're talking about the church. And it says, and he himself gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some shepherds and teachers for this reason, for the perfecting of the saints into the work of the ministry, unto the building of the body of Christ. The perfecting of the saints for the building of the body of Christ. Not numerically. Because I believe some of the strongest believers I've ever known are in small churches that huddle themselves together, that are persecuted in every way. And the strength of the church is not in the numbers. The strength in the church is in the maturity of the soul, the heart, the passion, 
Do you have a passion for the cause of Christ? Do you absolutely desire what God is doing within your life? Are you never satisfied with where you are? And I believe when he gave all these apostles and teachers and preachers and, and evangelists and disciples, I believe it's for one reason. I believe it's for connection. I believe the body of Christ needs to grow in maturity, and growing in maturity gives us a vision for the future. But if we are satisfied, if we are complacent, if we can look at what's taking place around the world and is not moved with compassion, what we're saying is Christianity is for me. Christianity is for what I do on Sunday morning. Christianity is for the children's ministry or the youth ministry. But Christianity, the cause of Jesus Christ, people that are standing up for the name of Christ, it's much bigger than that. It has to be bigger than that. Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. Our passion should be to honor him. Now, if we're looking at what our passion should be, how can a church, how can this church, how can your church grow in maturity and strength and power in the upcoming year? I proclaimed this message Wednesday, and I want to share it with you today. I shared it in a brief form during the business meeting, but some of the people that were in the business meeting asked me if I would be able to share this. What, what makes Glenville? How are we the church that the cell group called Glenville? How are we going to move into the future? How are we going to become strong? And I, I know that you probably don't have, um, you have passion for the church, and you have passion for Christ. And what I really want is I want our passion, our visions, our direction to be in such a unified position that what we do is we grow in maturity and grow in numerical growth because we have a passion for Christ. Now, Andy Stanley gave me this quote. Your current template is perfectly designed to produce the results you are currently getting. Your current template is perfectly designed to produce the results you're currently getting. In other words, let me give you this illustration. If this is the problem, everybody's got problems, right? This is the problem. This is the end result of the problem or the product. How are you going to change from the problem to the end result of the product is called the process. And what we have to do is we have to look at, we have this problem, whatever the problem is, whether it's positive or negative, this is the problem. We have a process that we're going to go through to get an end result of a product that we want it to be a positive outcome. The only way that we can do something different, if we always have this problem, we always have this same outcome, we always have the same end result, problem, end result, problem, end result, what we have to do is we have to change the what? Change the process. We have to change the way that we see things done. If the process always gives us the same result, what we must do is we must evaluate what can we do differently to have a different outcome, whether it is in your marriage. If you have the same problem, you do the same thing, and you get the same product, sooner or later you're going to step back and say, hmm, I've got to do something different. I've got to try something new. And in the church world, if we get the same product, what we must do is we have to reevaluate what are we going to do. So over the last few weeks and months, we've been thinking about our church and, and what the church needs to be and what Glenville should do. And I've listed five things that I believe if we have to evaluate the process, what we need to do to get a different result or a different product, we have to evaluate. And the first thing that we put down is the weekends is the weekends, is the, the worship experience. What can we do to enhance the ability to witness, the ability to worship, the ability to teach, the ability to preach, the ability to experience people's faith in Christ? What is that? And I believe the weekend experience is not the only way to communicate Christ, but it is a way to hit as many people as possible about the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We have to make our weekend experience such an awesome event that when somebody walks in these doors, or whether you're struggling and you're coming in, 
Maybe you need faith in Christ and you're coming into these doors and you have no idea what to expect. What you experience is the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Christ. If we experience anything other than what Christ has given to us, if we experience bickering, if we experience a dead, faithless, non-exciting, unmotivated church, if we experience that, why do we ever expect God to give to us people to minister to if we are not alive in our faith? Why? Oh, because we have good music? Because the pastor can communicate? Because we have a wonderful building? That doesn't do it. Our faith has to be much greater than our abilities on the platform. It has to be something deeper within us. We have to have a passion and a faith and a love for Christ. So what does that look like? What does that look like? If we say it's all about the weekend, does that mean that Sunday morning at 11 o'clock is the time that we put on our Christian faith? We put on the Christian mask and we put our smile on our face? Because I know, I know many of you. I've counseled with many of you about a lot of different things. And I know that on Sunday morning, you're walking through those doors, and as soon as you get out of the car, you take that mask and you put it on. And you put the smile on your face, and <laughs> everything's wonderful. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. We walk out that door as miserable as what we were when we walked in the door. And if that is the case, when you experience Christ, the church is not doing its job. We have the greatest power at our disposal, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit to change our lives, the Word of God to motivate us to get into the Word of God to help people's lives. And it doesn't just happen on Sunday morning, but the end result, the product, is Sunday morning. The process is every day. The process is our life. I'm going to use an illustration that was not prepared, but I'm going to use it anyway. Gary, I hope you don't care. Um, Gary Johnson just lost his wife uh, last week. Um, I had the privilege of ministering to him and, and her and going to the hospital and sharing with them. And uh, uh, in that process, uh, Shannon... Uh, knew the Lord. She was baptized when she was 24 years old and she gave her life to Christ. And Gary was saved at Glenville back when he was a teenager. And uh, it's a neat experience, you know, knowing that I can share a, a memorial service of, of, a, of a fellowship that she's in heaven and there's going to be a reunion. I, that's awesome. But what's even greater is because of her death, last Wednesday, at 10 o'clock, this auditorium was almost full of people. And we got to talk about Shannon. We got to talk about her death. But we also got to talk about her life. We got to talk about her going to heaven. We got to talk about why she's going to heaven. We got to talk about not going to heaven because she was good. We got to talk about her going to heaven because of her faith. And any time that you can take any issue, and I believe sometimes out of the deepest calamities of life, the deepest pains that we ever experience, those are the times that we can glorify Christ. Those are the times we feel like everything is falling apart and there is no hope. Those are the times we could take some seed of hope, some seed that's deep within our soul, and we can proclaim it. And we have no idea. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know why we have to go through that. But because we're going through that, we could take the opportunity to proclaim the message of Christ. It's very sad. It's very sad. Olivia, a little five-year-old little girl, that uh, it, the church is not Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. It's not just the weekend. We do everything we need to do through the week in order to point people to the opportunity to see Jesus Christ. Bring them to the fellowship. Bring them to the body. 
The weekend is an opportunity to experience what Christ has done for us and through us through the week. If we become mature, if we are follower after Christ, I think there's nothing that the church cannot and should not be able to do. Many of you know um, a guy that was a member of our church for a long time. His name is Jim Lyons. And Jim moved to California. And uh, he just found out a few months ago that he has stage 4 cancer. And uh, he's going through chemo and um, he's hurting. He's hurting. And um, I call him, I try to call him once a week or once, once every other week just to talk to him. I called him yesterday and I said, I said, well, Jim, how you doing? And he goes, man, Bruce, this sucks. And he goes, this hurts. He said, I do the chemo and then the next day I, I'm out of it. I'm sick. It's just, it's just nasty. I wouldn't wish this on anybody. So I'm sitting here and I really don't have the words to say. I mean, because... I've never experienced that. And I just wanted to pray with him and let him know that the church is lifting him up and, and we're praying with him and we're encouraging him. But in calamity, in issues of life, that's where the body of Christ must come together and encourage and to help and to challenge one another. And not just Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Because if that's all our church is, is Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we are not doing what God wants us to do. And he himself gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some shepherds and teachers for the perfecting or the, the helping of the saints into the work of the ministry unto the building up of the body of Christ. The building up. Man, if I could be so honest and say, we have a lot of messed up people we have a wonderful church. We have a lot of great people. We have a lot of people that have a passion for Christ. And those people, we need to come together with the hurting, with the struggling, with the mature believers to all together raise up in community and in family. You know, in Egypt, when 21 men gave up their life for the name of Jesus Christ, they're part of our family. When they are hurting we should hurt. When the name of Christ is being exalted even in death, we should exalt the name of Christ. What would it be like? What would it be like in our culture today if we, the body of Christ in the Western civilization, we in the United States of America, if we are confronted, are we strong enough? Are we built up enough? Are we mature enough? Are we Sunday morning? Do we play the game of Christianity, or is it genuinely real? The second thing is group up. The first thing that we need to do is we need to do the weekend. The second thing is we need to group up. A new pro a program that we implemented just about a year ago is our community groups. And I believe it's very important for us, the larger we get, the smaller we become. Group up is an opportunity for us to minister to another in, in connection, in caring for one another, in loving for one another. If, if um, today's not a good day to use this illustration because of the weather and we're, we're kind of halfway down, but the idea is the, the, the group up is people on the left hand of the auditorium, they really don't know what the people on the right hand are doing. The people that come to the 9 o'clock really don't know the people that come to the 11 o'clock. And there's all kinds of different issues within the church. And it's an opportunity for us to find connection with individuals within the body of Christ. And it may be your thing. And it may not be your thing. You may say, I don't want to do the groups. And we're not going to force anybody to do the groups. But it's an opportunity if you say, I don't really know anybody at the church. I want that connection. I'm asking us to think about grouping up. Thinking about becoming a community group with each other. It does a couple things. It causes family fellowship. The family fellowship. Sometimes when we move to Wichita, Kansas, and, and we're all from different individuals, different places, and we come here, we really don't have family and we don't have a spiritual family. So a family unity that we can come together and we can grow with each other spiritually and care for each other. And then pastoral care. Pastoral care. I believe that the community groups gives pastoral care. It gives to us an opportunity that when somebody is hurting, when somebody's in the hospital, when somebody needs a meal, when somebody needs a hospital call or a family visit or they even need some issues financially, it's an opportunity for us as a community group to help each other and to love each other and to minister to each other. So group up is very important. And then 
The third thing is help. That's a simple word for, for volunteerism. Volunteerism. If I can say this, I believe the church, if we're going to move into the future, we're going to be powerful into the future, we have to have a group of individuals that have a passion to serve others. A passion to serve others. A volunteer base. Like, like our band up here this morning. Every one of the guys that were on the band, on the praise team, and singer are all just volunteers. They do it because they love Christ. They do it because they just want to serve you. They may love music, but they're using their gifts and their abilities, what God has taught them, what they have worked hard to obtain. They're doing that to honor God and doing that to serve you. Volunteerism, I believe, is the key. See, um, I, I like this morning. I drove up early this morning. I was thinking, oh, I got up, and I looked outside, and I said, I said I'm going to have to get to the church. I'm going to have to do the sidewalks. I'm going to have to put the salt down. I said, ah, you know, you really didn't want to get up early and get out in the cold and do that. So um, I got here, and I pulled up, and we had a guy at our church that works at a landscaping place. He had his truck out here, and he was salting the parking lot. He was salting all the sidewalks. And I thought, praise Jesus. <laughs> you know? I didn't ask him to do it. He just said, you know, I was out anyway, so I thought I'd come over, and I thought I'd salt the parking lot and take care of the sidewalks for you. And I thought, you know what? That's thumbs up, man, because <laughs> I was about ready to get out in that cold weather, and I was going to do it, and he said, I didn't want you to have to do it because I know you're a pansy, but I did it for you. So <laughs> I said, all right, praise Jesus. I don't care why you do it as long as you do it. Volunteerism is looking for something and obtaining it, looking for ownership and say, I think this is what God has called me to do. Not being asked, not I'll do it if somebody asks me to. Uh, volunteerism is what can I do? Looking around a church, looking around your ministry with fresh eyes, saying, you know what, I know, Bruce, you've been here for 16 years, and I know that you don't see a lot of things because you're blinded to what you think is right or what you think should take place, but when I walked in here, I saw there's a lot of nicks on the walls, and there's a lot of things that need to be taken care of, and you know what, I think I can do that. Would you mind if I help out in that area? Yeah, I'm sure. Volunteerism is looking for ways to own the building, own the ministry, help out in certain ways. I believe when we do that, it involves our gifts, our abilities, and our talents. And then um, there's a couple things that I wanted to hit very strongly on. Uh, the, the next one is our children's ministry. I believe moving into the future, our children's ministry has to be a priority. And where do we take our priority? Well, our first priority is going to be our, our preschool and our nursery area. We are taking this year, and we're going to try to raise enough funds to pay as we go to renovate and update our entire preschool nursery area. We are taking our Easter offering this year, and our goal is to be six to $8,000 in our Easter offering. All of that money is going to go straight into our preschool and nursery area. We're going to do fundraisers throughout the year. Our goal is to take thirteen dollars to $15,000 and pay as we go, no debt, and renovate the nursery. The nursery facility is in the place where the first church started back in 1956. And you know what? When you go back to the nursery area, you can tell it was started in 1956. It needs a facelift. Because why is it so important? Our culture... We, we have a little baby back. I, I don't really know who you are, but you, you came in today. How, how old is the baby? One week old. Brand new baby. Come to church. Brand new baby. Didn't, even, didn't invite them. They, they came into church. How important is when a brand new baby comes into our church that when we give to them the nursery, the nursery is clean, the nursery is safe, the nursery is up to date, and well-staffed. If we think, well, you know what? They, they, when I was a kid, my mom just dropped me off in there and they picked me up at 12 o'clock. Well, the culture doesn't do that anymore. The culture wants to make sure that baby is safe, clean, and taken care of. And we want to make sure all of our children are taken care of, clean, and in a safe environment. Back in 1956, it was a nice building. In 2015, it looks like it was back in 1956. So if it was your house and you have a 60-year-old building, there would be times that you would repaint the wall and replace the carpet and do things to make it look good. And I believe our children 
need that, and that's what our priority is going to be this year, is to raise funds in order to remodel, reface lift the entire preschool children's area. I think it's very important. So you can either do that now, you can even start writing on your check, preschool remodel, put 50 bucks in there, five bucks in there, you can put 100 bucks in there every week, and we'll be a happy camper. But we're going to pay as we go as we do that. Our last point is our youth ministry. I need, to, I need you to grasp this, and this is something I have to grasp. Our youth ministry, from the ages of 13 to 21 years of age, they are so much more talented, they have so much more intellect, they have so much more passion, and what we must do as a church is we have to bring that to us and not repel it from us. How many of you guys have a teenager in the house? How many of you guys have, ever have problems with your phone at the house? Or your computer at the house? What do you do? I do. Bryson, come here. Take care of it. There you go. What would you do? I don't need you just do this. You know, show me. I can't show you. I mean, you're too stupid to know it. I just do it. That's the kids, they're I'm like, I'm out, I'm 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 lost. They have so much more abilities in their creativity, in their vision, and in their passion. And listen to this. The majority of the people that give their life to Christ give their life to Christ before the age of 16. If that is the case, that the passionate followers of Jesus Christ do so at an early age, we want to make sure that we give them the ability and the opportunity to make Glenville theirs. It's not the big church and the youth church. It is our church. That's what I like about Justin putting all these teenagers in the band up here. Why? is It's their church. I don't want to be part of a church that when they graduate from high school, they graduate from church because the church is irrelevant to them. We have to give to them the opportunity to enlist in the ministry, to do what we're called to do, to empower them, not just to come to church. But these 16, 17, 18-year-old kids that have a passion and a love for Christ, that their fire can inflame us, could cause us to wonder what we could be. What is it that they have? They have a love and a passion for Christ. We do not want to be a church that when the kids graduate from high school, they graduate from church. They come back to church when they have kids because the church is stuck. The process is dead. We have a problem. The product, they're gone. They leave. What we must do is we must understand the process has to be tweaked. We must love them, encourage them, engage them. Because I guarantee you, whether you've experienced this because your kids are already through high school, or whether you're experiencing it now, your kids are in high school, or your kids are going to go to high school, there's one thing that you want more than anything else is you want your children to have a passion and a love for Jesus Christ. You want them to know that Jesus Christ forgave them. You want them to know that when they have troubles, that Jesus Christ will be right beside them. You don't want them to go outside the experience of Jesus Christ. You want them to have a passion for Christ. And the only way those kids, children or youth, will ever see a passion for the church is if they see the passion for the church through you. And they will emulate you. They have the intelligence. They have the passion for life. But do they see the genuine passion of Jesus Christ? Do they see you? Do they see me really loving Christ? Is the church something we go to? Is the church the Sunday morning event? Or is the church much greater than that. See, if we have the mindset that the church is at 4604 South Seneca and these four walls and we come to church either at 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and we give our little bit of money and the church does its thing and we come back next week, we have a very small perception of the power of God. Because God put to us one task and that task is to be the voice, the feet, and the hands of God. Our job is to communicate 
the power and the forgiveness of God. Our job in the church is not to enjoy church. Our job is to use Christ through the church to redeem mankind. When somebody is struggling, the church comes alongside. When somebody is hurting, the church comes alongside. When somebody feels like it's a, they're destitute and they're ready to quit it, they're ready to end their life, who's going to come alongside them? It's going to be family. It's going to be friends. It's going to be people that engaged their life. It needs to be the church. We live in a culture let me back this up. Our church culture is this in the majority of the churches that if you don't fit like us, talk like us, and look like us, find another place to go. What we have to have at this church, we have to be called a grace filled church. We want people just to come. Would you do something that I don't agree with is not the issue. The issue is not what Pastor Bruce would say. The issue is I want to get in connection with God. I may communicate the truth. I may talk to you about what the Bible says. But you do not live your life, nor should you live your life, to please the pastor. You need to live your life trying to please God. And when you come to church... I believe the church is, needs to be full of seekers that are struggling. It needs to be full of believers that are mature. It needs to be full of people that really don't have a way. And when they come together in unity, when they are seeking and there are maturity, what we do is we become family and we grow, we love, and we minister. Because the Bible says that he brought together prophets and preachers and teachers and disciples, evangelists for the perfecting of the church to grow up in the body of Christ. The body is you and I. So, where do we go this year? What are we going to do? We want to evaluate the process. We want to tweak what is broken. We want to ask the church to evaluate, to look at, and to assimilate into this church. We want the membership of the church to grow, but we want the body to be grown in maturity. How do we do that? It is not just attend church. We need to own church. This needs to be your church. We need to look at this facility. We need to look at our calling and look at the ministry and say, how can I make it better? How can we do what God wants me to do and make it better? What can we do? What can I do to make this church the best church that it could possibly be? And when we have the five to 700 individuals, maybe today 150, who knows, that have a passion to make this church grow in strength and maturity, what happens is people's lives are changed. People are rescued. Marriages are healed. Finances are restored. Bodies are taken care of. We can lay our hands on individuals and we can see God's miraculous divine healing take place. Why? Is because we have faith. We have faith. If our church, if our future rests upon the process that causes us to fail, we are doomed. But if our future is in the process of what can we do to evaluate, to make changes, what we can do is grow. 80, think of every church that you know, 80% of all churches are either stagnated or declining. 80%. Stagnated or declining. Why is it? in the process there's problems in every church the end result is a product the end result in 80% of the churches are stagnated and declining why is it? it's because they look at the process and they say I'm not going to touch that I may offend somebody they may get mad and quit the church 
what happens is the youth walk out the door, the older individuals die off the scene, and what happens? We're left with a stagnated, dead church. What we must do in order to move into the future is we must look, what is the calling of the church? And the calling that Jesus put on the church is Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost. We must have evangelism. We must have discipleship. We must have worship. We must have ministry to fulfill people's lives. We must have counseling. We must do all kinds of different things. But it has to be the body of Christ doing its share. Not the show, the body doing its share. And when we do that, we can do great things. We can do what God wants us to do. So how do we get there? We get there by asking God to grow us. We get there by trying to become mature. We get there by saying, I don't want just to be a Christian. I want to be a passionate follower of Christ. I want to have that flame within my life, the power of God within my life. I want God to do something bigger with me and through me than I could ever do by myself. I don't want to put on a mask, put a smile on my face on Sunday morning, tell everybody everything's great. I want to wake up knowing that Jesus loves me. Jesus forgave me. I am been forgiven, and I have the greatest power within my life, and I can help somebody else go through the same thing that I've gone through. And when you have purpose, and you have security, and you have purpose within your life to fulfill ministry, you can do great things. We just need to ask God to grow us, not numerically, but in maturity. And I believe when that takes place, God does great things. Let's go, to Lord, in prayer. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you, and Lord, we thank you. Lord, I pray you'll instill within our hearts and our lives a passion, a passion to honor you. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters that are under persecution, even terrorism. Lord, we, we thank you for what you've promised us. That if we name the name of Jesus, that your arms will be around us and you will protect us. And I pray that you'll be with each person that's under persecution today, whether it's overseas or here in the United States, even in Wichita, Kansas, that you will protect us when we lift up the name of Jesus. This world does not like and they will not understand, but we know that your power will give us hope and give us grace and give us encouragement along the way. Be with us as we honor you, as we serve you for the rest of our lives. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.